or what was it? All right. Well, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Kayla Har. Um, I am actually currently uh, working on a master's degree in neat science. Um, I'm originally from Jeromesville, Ohio, so actually I'm currently sitting in Ohio um, as we speak due to the coronavirus, and so um, I'm back here working um, remotely on a master's degree. Um, I actually graduated from Kansas State in December uh, with a bachelor's degree in animal science. Um, I was actively involved on the meat judging team, the livestock judging team, as well as the meat animal evaluation team and so um, was active in a lot of different activities around campus and uh, really really enjoy ha, have enjoyed my time at Kansas State and continue to enjoy my time um, kind of a little bit more about my background I grew up on a diversified Hereford seed stock operation so my family we run purebred Hereford cattle we also farm uh, about 400 acres of hay and row crop ground and so we keep ourselves pretty busy I would ask that as you all, as we go through this presentation and uh, we talk a little bit more about meat judging and what is meat judging, if you have any questions, um, to please go ahead and type those in the chat room. Um, and I'll be sure to, I'll hopefully leave about five minutes or so at the end to answer some questions. Um, but feel free to type those in the chat room as we go if you all have any questions as well. And I'll try to keep this interactive. I might ask you all some questions. I'd ask that you all keep yourselves muted, um, but go ahead and ask those in the chat room uh, and I'll be sure to answer those as well. So uh, I know many of you are probably asking yourself, well, why did I tune into a session about meat judging? And so meat judging for you all in Kansas is part of your 4-H sweepstakes contest uh, that is held annually in August. Um, and this is one of the very few contests that there is a uh, junior intermediate and senior division. And so uh, we kind of split out um, you all into some different age breaks um, and that way give all of the members a, a more, excuse me, a more fair shot as you all um, go ahead and compete in this and also gives you uh, potentially a few more years of eligibility. Uh, the, the premise behind this contest is really just to teach you about the meat that you might be purchasing and consuming at home, um, teach you a little bit more about what to look for when identifying those cuts, um, as well as just kind of help you connect the dots and give you a better background um, between the things that we're looking at in our livestock production and what we're looking at on the live animal and then correlate that to basically how uh, those cattle those animals are going to look once we harvest them and how that's going to then in turn affect your um, eating experience as you go down to let's say eat a steak um, in the evening or whatever you might be consuming. Uh, additionally, this contest is one that uh, myself, along with many of my former meat judging teammates, uh, will easily tell you it's a really fun contest. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, as long as you can tell a, a trim carcass versus a fat carcass, you're going to get a lot of the basic concepts. And so um, it's a really, it's a fun and easy contest and it, it gives you an avenue uh, to compete as 4-H members. So uh, a few of the fundamentals of meat judging before we begin. Um, first off uh, is you're in a contest. Carcasses or cuts um, or whatever might be in front of you, those are always going to be numbered left to right. And so um, the very first carcass will be on your left and the fourth carcass will be on your right. Um, and so that's a, a big thing to note, no matter if you're in a meat judging contest, the livestock judging contest. In a meat judging contest, um, nearly all of the contests that uh, certainly we put on at K-State, those are always going to be numbered uh, as you look at those. Um, and then if we go ahead and if you're going to be giving reasons or answering questions during a contest, um, make sure that you take something to write on and take really detailed notes. 
those can be as simple as, uh, well, this carcass was trimmer than the, the first carcass was trimmer than the fourth carcass and kind of give a trimness ranking. Um, also looking at the muscling on those carcasses and, well, this one had a thicker, fuller ham or um, this one had a more bulging um, round or sirloin. Um, any of those that you can basically utilize those notes to go ahead and recall that class um, as you're either answering questions um, or, or taking reasons. Um, this is a very basic reasons format that I have here on the screen. Um, essentially start out by talking about why your first place uh, exhibit goes first, um, what does the second place exhibit um, do maybe a bit better than the first place, and then why does that second place exhibit um, just kind of fall out to the first place exhibit, and why does it simply go second. Uh, you're essentially going to repeat that same uh, sort of structure in your middle pair of basically why did you put two over three. Um, and then finally, in your bottom pair, you're going to state why the last placed exhibit goes last. Um, and certainly if you all have any questions or want some more information on reasons taking, um, for you all, you give oral reasons in your state contest. Um, feel free to reach out to myself or Dr. Travis O'Quinn, who is the current uh, meat judging coach and the 4-H meat judging coordinator at Kansas State, um, and we'll be more than happy to answer those for you. Um, additionally, you know, the Kansas contest also includes 30 cuts for retail identification, and so those can be a, just about any of the cuts that you would find in your typical grocery store, um, all the way up to some more specific cuts um, that you maybe wouldn't typically find, but still are available um, in the commercial industry and in our food service sector to be marketed. Um, and so I'd encourage you, there's a lot of really, really good uh, online resources to go and uh, look through those um, that are gonna give you more information about the cookery of those, kind of some uh, tips and tricks uh, to go ahead and um, identify those cuts as well. And certainly feel free to go to the grocery store. That's one of the uh, really underutilized um, practice tools for retail identification and go through and um, identify cuts. I certainly know at the moment that's a little hard, so, uh, but um, definitely a, a great tool for you all if you want to get involved. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into pork judging. Um, and we're gonna first start out by looking at some anatomy. And so on the left-hand side of your screen, we have some pork carcass terminology. Um, and so uh, if we're looking at this very first image of this pork carcass, um, we're looking at essentially the outside of that animal. And so you would be, this would be what you're seeing if you're looking at a um, pig from the profile view or you're standing alongside of that pig. And so we start out and we have your ham, which is up here uh, towards the top. Um, and let me put on my pointer option. So we have your ham that's up here at the top. Um, and that's going to be, the ham is going to be closest to how that um, pork carcass is being hung. And so we're gonna hang your pork carcass here by the foot in that Achilles tendon. Um, and so basically in our ham, we're looking for bulge or plumpness of that ham. Um, and think if you think about this, if you're um, looking at a basketball, you want that to be kind of that um, round plump shape to that ham. We then move down and look at your sirloin. Um, and so we're basically looking for bulge and flare here in this sirloin. And so that usually if they have a really big sirloin on it, um, that's kind of going to, there's gonna, it's going to come out. And then as we go into our loin, it's going to come back in. And so that's in, indicating that they have a really big full sirloin. Next, we're going to look at our loin. Uh, and then over here, we can look at our loin edge. And so basically, we're looking for the amount of shape that's in that 
the flatter it is, then typically they're going to have less muscle. Whereas if they have a lot of flare and turn to that top. Some of you that have maybe shown some pigs, uh, we really want a big flare and turn to that live animal's top. Well, that essentially correlates uh, then to when we harvest these animals. Um, and so we're still looking for that same big flare and turn uh, as that's going to be a more indicative of if they have a larger loin eye. We then go down here and we're looking at our shoulder. So basically, everything from this black line down. Um, we're looking basically just for thickness and fullness uh, here in this shoulder. Additionally, we'll also look at our jowl as we talk about our trimness factors. And so basically the, the more jowl fat that they have, so basically this black line and down, um, then the more um, we can say they have more jowl fat or they have less jowl fat. Now also note that as we're talking about jowl, uh, many a times that that jowl is actually cut off during the harvest process. And so if you go into a contest and see that there's no jowl fat on them, then don't be alarmed. It's just simply they cut that off uh, as they were harvesting those pigs. We then go over and look at basically, we flip this image here on the left over um, and we're looking at basically what would be inside of that carcass. So we split pigs uh, down the center. And so we're looking here, our, one of our very big indicators of trimness on a pig is looking at their back fat. And so that's going to be right here along their back because right here we have our tail up here. And so we're going to look at fat opposite the last rib. And so just find your last rib, go over, and that's going to be where you find your fat opposite your last rib. Uh, similarly, if you go down and find your first rib down here, uh, gonna be about right there, and you're gonna go over and find how much first rib fat they have. And then if we go up here, and we can also look at our last lumbar fat. Um, and so this is going to be opposite our last lumbar vertebra, which is usually going to be right in here, or where these vertebrae right here along. So this is where their spinal column sits in there, uh, kind of right there in that indentation. Uh, we're going to go up here, and as we see our vertebrae start curling over towards the tail, kind of making a, a um, you over towards the tail, then we're going to go opposite that vertebrae and that's going to be where you find your last lumbar fat. We can also look up here and we um, evaluate our ham collar fat and so this is just the amount of fat here. You can usually um, evaluate this by the thickness of that fat of how much ham collar fat they have. We then go down here into the flank region um, and we're going to look at how much fat there is in the belly pocket. So right here where that arrow is, we're going to evaluate fat along the navel edge. And so on pork carcasses, it's fairly easy. Uh, you can generally just tell by the thickness of this fat. So this white, uh, basically from where the red lean tissue stops to the white um, to where that skin on is, um, if skin is still on, that's going to be the amount of fat uh, that, that that carcass has. We also have fat along the sternum. So think um, basically kind of the, uh, basically where that front foot is coming out of, um, that's kind of going to be in your sternum region. And then of course I talked about jowl fat. Uh, we also have some other factors that we can look at. Uh, if we're referring to the lumbar lean, this is going to be this region up here. Uh, we can evaluate from a quality perspective fat streakings in our lumbar lean up here, as well as we can also look at feathering in uh, between the ribs down here. So uh, we have our, our rib bones and then that muscle in there. The more fat streakings it has in there, then that's going to be indicative of more marbling uh, that could potentially be in that loin eye when we go ahead and rib this carcass. Now we don't typically rib pigs in the U.S. Uh, for a judging contest perspective and a, a learning perspective for you all. We'll sometimes go ahead and rib these carcasses to expo expose the uh, loin eye 
And so this is an image over on the right side of your screen. This is going to be a longissimus muscle or uh, your loin eye. So this is gonna be where your pork chop comes from. Um, and so we're gonna look at the basically um, size of this loin eye. Uh, of course, bigger is better. We want more lean muscle tissue, uh, more meat from that animal. And then we're also going to look at our 10th rib back fat. And so we actually rib our pigs between the 10th and 11th rib. Uh, so we could just count up from this first rib to the 10th um, and then s s rib that carcass at the 10th and 11th. And so our 10th rib back fat, we're just measuring the fat depth. So basically how much fat is there from the very edge of this muscle from the very edge of the red part to the outside of that carcass. That's going to be how much fat that that um, pork carcass has. So then if we evaluate our pork placing rules, we're going to place the majority of our emphasis as we place pork carcasses on trimness. And so that's going to be about 70% of our emphasis. Trimness is really, really big. Um, if we look at this on, as we calculate some different formulas um, and within the, that we can utilize within the industry, we're looking the most heavily on trimness and that's essentially what drives the value of these pork carcasses as we go ahead and further fabricate them and then send them to restaurants, consumers, uh, to Walmart to be marketed to consumers, anything of that sort. Uh, trimness is the biggest driver in determining that uh, carcass's value. So, of course, less fat is better. Um, our primary emphasis is going to be on the back. So, if we go back a slide, this is going to be again this um, back of this animal. So, the last rib back fat the fat opposite the lumbar lean and flat fat opposite the first rib. Um, and then our secondary factors, we're still going to place some emphasis on them, but not a ton of emphasis is not as much so as if we looked at the back um, of those. And so our, our biggest concern is looking at um, the fat on the back or the dorsal side of that. Um, then if we're our trimness, if we have two carcasses or two different hams or loins uh, and trimness is similar, then we're going to go ahead and evaluate muscle. And so muscle we're going to place about 30% of our emphasis on. Essentially we're just going to use muscle if it's a deciding factor between a two pair uh, in which trimness is close. And so we're just again looking for bulge and thickness. Um, in the primary, uh, the easiest place to look for that is in that ham and in the shoulder. Uh, typically, if those are thicker um, and fuller between two carcasses, then you can generally assume that your loin and sirloin is going to go that way as well. Certainly for you all from a 4-H perspective, um, we're not going to try to trick you or fool you by, uh, by placing um, a carcass in that, oh, it has a, a much thicker and fuller loin, um, but its sirloin goes the other way and the ham goes the opposite way of that. So we'll try to keep that as basic and simple for you as possible. Again, we're looking at our ham, our sirloin, our loin shoulder. And then if you have the luxury of having uh, rib pork carcasses, we're going to go ahead and look at that loin eye as well. Uh, certainly, we also take some emphasis on the quality, um, but this is more for you all from a reasons and note-taking perspective of noting um, the lumbar lean color, the fat streakings within the lumbar lean, uh, the color of the belly, um, just some of those small quality differences, um, especially in pork carcasses, are um, our main emphasis is going to be on color. Um, if you all could please mute your mics.
Um, and so um, these same general principles, uh, of course, apply to uh, our hams and our pork loins that you might also see in a contest, um, and also any cuts that you might get, such as pork chops, ham steaks, anything of that nature. And so we'll go ahead and um, I'd ask that uh, certainly if you all want to type in the chat box, um, what your placing of this would be, but we have um, two pork carcasses, so we have a pair to place here. Um, we have, of course, carcass number one on the left side, carcass number two on the right side. Um, and go ahead and, and look at, notice that there's a, a pretty big trimness difference uh, here between those two. Um, here, especially as we look at fat opposite our last rib. And so um, one is going to be placed over two um, simply because it has less fat here along the back. It has uh, less caught fat over the ham collar um, and has a little bit, it's similar in uh, the amount of fat that's here along the belly um, compared to the number two. Um, and so number two has quite a bit of fat here up over the ham collar uh, and quite a bit of fat here along the um, uh, dorsal edge or on the back of that pork carcass. And so pretty simple um, if just basically we, we look primarily at the fat thickness of these pork carcasses. Now if we uh, take it up a notch and we're looking and evaluating four different carcasses. Uh, this was actually a con or a class that was in a contest, in a collegiate contest. Um, and so if we look at these um, pretty easily, we see first off that this number four carcass is easily the fattest. It's got the most fat here along opposite the last rib, opposite the first rib, um, it's, it's got quite a bit of fat right there. Then if we go ahead and look at the other end of who is the trimmest, we can look and see that number three is probably it, between it and two. There's not a whole lot of fat here on the uh, back of that animal. Um, and then, but then if we go up and look here at this ham collar and kind of along the belly edge, um, the number two actually has less fat over the collar. Um, yep, I'm seeing some four is the worst. Uh, yep, so far like in those placings that y'all are typing in, they're good. Um, so in this class, um, between two and three, trimness is pretty similar. Four definitely goes last. Um, and then one is also similar, uh, um, probably ranks third in, t in terms of trimness, so it'll go ahead and be third. So if we have trimness is close between two and three, we're going to turn these around and look at the muscling difference. So this would be number two, this would be number three. If we look at muscling on those, um, three has a much bigger cushion, has more bulge and flare to this sirloin uh, right here. Um, and also these are slightly distorted in the, the way that they are, but probably has a little bit more actual thickness uh, here in the shoulder. And so my placing of this class would be three, two, one, four. Um, and just in terms of, of muscle, you definitely have to keep two and three in that top pair, um, especially with trimness being so close between them. So pretty easy class. Now we'll look at a class or a pair of hams here. Um, and so this is just some of our fresh ham terminology. Um, and so we're looking here, if we look in the middle, uh, we're looking at our butt face, so that's going to be the exposed lean portion that basically we split this and split off our sirloin, um, and so we have fat underneath the butt face. Um, we have, if we go up top, we have fat over our, uh, our collar fat again. Um, we have fat over our forecushion here on the side, um, fat alongside the butt face, 
And then if we're going to look at our muscle, we're of course going to evaluate the area of exposed lean in our butt face. But more importantly, oh, here, I can type in the placing. Um, more importantly, as we, we look at this, um, uh, is on these hams, um, we're going to look back here at our center section and basically again evaluate kind of how much bulge um, and flare and compare, again, compare that to a basketball um, of how much just kind of round shape that th that ham has in the back. And so as we look at this pair of hams, um, between these two, if you all want to go ahead and type in the chat, uh, which one is the trimmest? Yep, see a one, two, one, yep, very good. Yep, and if you want to go ahead and place, yep, all right, very good. So pretty easy again. Um, one is definitely, definitely, way trimmer than number two. Two is pretty fat. He's got a lot of fat underneath this um, butt face, uh, has a lot of fat over here on along our fore cushion. I would presume has quite a bit of fat over the collar as well. So if we then go ahead and look at a class of pork chops, we're again uh, primarily placing our emphasis on our trimness. And so again, um, number two has a lot of fat that you're going to throw in the trash can um, and probably not eat, whereas number one has a lot of meat and lean tissue here, and so um, you're going to have more, more meat here to eat when compared to number two. And so that's basically our primary emphasis is we're placing these retail cut classes as well. Do you all have any questions on pork judging? All right, well, um, if you all don't have any questions, we'll go ahead and move on. And certainly if you do have questions, feel free to type those in and I'll try to answer them at the end. Next, we'll go on to lamb judging. Um, and so lamb judging, we're primarily just going to be evaluating lamb carcasses. Um, and so go through here and talk a little bit about kind of some anatomy. And so um, for starters, we have our leg up here. Um, and so we're going to evaluate fat over the leg. And so on lambs, it's really easy to tell if they kind of have more of this um, we call it blue or kind of that red tint. White fat is, or fat is usually going to be white, and so we're looking for more of that red tint um, or that bluing, um, and kind of going to be a blue or sort of color on that lean. Um, and so we have our leg, our sirloin, we can have fat over our sirloin. Again, we're looking for thickness and fullness of that leg and sirloin. Um, as we're um, evaluating from a muscle standpoint, we have fat over our loin edge and our loin right in here. Then we have our rack. Um, so that's going to be where ribs are attached. Um, and then we have our shoulder down here as well. So we're going to still be, um, which is going to be thicker and wider uh, when we're evaluating our shoulder from a muscle standpoint. We can also have fat over the dock, so of course going to correspond to where the dock of that animal would be. Um, we can have fat in the crotch. Um, we can also have fat in the flank pocket. We can have cod or udder fat, so cod fat um, is going to be like a cluster of grapes, whereas udder fat is always going to be smooth. Um, we can also have fat over the breast um, and fat in the arm pocket. Um, similarly, uh, typically you won't find lambs that have been ribbed, but you're going to, again, we have our lamb ribeye, and so we're going to evaluate that for basically how big, uh, you want bigger is better in that, 
and we can also evaluate fat along the body wall. So that's just going to be the full thickness from the rib to the outside um, of that, that body wall. We also have fat thickness. So again, going about uh, two thirds to three quarters um, opposite that rib. Um, and that's where we're going to measure our fat thickness. Um, if we look inside of this, our lambs are always going to have both sides, so it's going to be a full lamb carcass. Um, we can look at our flank streakings that are going to be uh, kind of right here. If you look inside of that, um, you can pull that over and there's going to be flank streakings, so that's just going to be those streaks of white, um, streaks of white fat. That's an indicator of the quality that that lamb carcass is going to have. So again, we're going to place our, the majority of our emphasis on trimness and lamb carcasses. Uh, we want more of an hourglass shape as we're evaluating these lamb carcasses. Uh, if they have a boat shape, they're, they're really round. Um, that means they're going to typically be fatter. Um, and so we want, again, this hourglass shape. Um, so we have some indentation as they come um, out of their leg. Um, and into their loin, and then they're again going to curve out um, and, and go into their shoulder. Um, we're also going to evaluate muscle. So if trimness is similar, we're going to evaluate muscle. Again, we want bulge and thickness um, is similar, similar to our pork carcasses. Uh, and then we can also evaluate quality. So flank streakings, um, a young lamb, those, that's always going to be indicated by a break joint. So um, on their front legs, uh, where we basically take off their foot, um, you want there to be, a, it's a similar shape on those front trotters uh, that it looks like a waffle on those. Whereas a spool joint, that's going to be they're like um, a spool of yarn or they're going to be um, kind of rounded over. And so we want break joints because that's indicative, indicative of a young carcass. And so we always want younger carcasses because that uh, is associated with a better eating experience when you go ahead and go eat that lamb versus mutton, uh, which is an older lamb. So here's a class of lamb carcasses. So um, we went over our parts. So what are your all's best guesses on a placing of this class? Again, we're wanting an hourglass figure. Um, and we don't want a boat shape. <laughs> All right, well, I don't see anything going in the chat quite yet. Um, and so, yeah, oh, yep, yep. All right, so. Um, four down here, you can see a lot of um, blue per se. Uh, hopefully this makes a little bit more sense now when this is up on the screen. Um, there's a lot of blue here on his, on this carcass's leg, over this loin and rack. Um, whereas if we go down and look at the opposite end, one, see how it has a really round shape over the rack and loin. Um, and it's, this is a really fat lamb carcass. Um, and so then we're, we're kind of left with a middle pair here between three and two. They're fairly similar in trim, or fa fairly similar in trimness. Uh, one maybe has a little bit more blue showing over the rack and loin, um, but two has a maybe thicker, fuller leg. Um, so my placing of this would be a four, three, two, four, three, two, one. Um, and that's just simply four is easily the trimmest, one's the fattest, um, three has a little bit more blue, two has a little bit more blue, a little bit trimmer, um, two has a little bit more muscle up here in the leg, but probably a little fatter over their 
loin. There's not as much indentation here as we go from this loin, from their sirloin into their loin. Uh, so typically that's going to be indicative of that carcass being a little bit fatter compared to three. We'll go ahead and move into some beef judging. Um, so, of course, we have our beef carcass here. Um, and up here we have at the top where this animal, the carcass is going to be hanging from their shank. Um, we have our round. And so, again, we're looking at thickness and fullness of this round. Um, we drop down, and as that starts to go into this loin, we have our sirloin. Um, Again, we're looking for kind of that bulge and flare to that as it comes out of that rump. Uh, then we have our loin, so we can have fat over our loin. Uh, again, we're looking as we looked at our hogs and our pigs, uh, we want kind of that um, bulge and flare uh, per se to that loin and have a lot of curvature um, and, and roundness um, to that. Uh, then we are again looking at the same thing as we look into our rib. And then as we get down into our chuck or our shoulder um, of that animal, uh, we're looking again for bulge and thickness, uh, thickness and width to that chuck uh, and that shoulder. Uh, we can also have fat over the brisket uh, down here. So if any of you have eaten um, brisket at a barbecue restaurant or uh, have a family that barbecues a lot, you you might have eaten brisket. That's going to come uh, down here. Basically, the brisket sits in between the animal's front legs um, and is attached here at the bottom of this truck. Uh, we can also have cod and udder fat uh, is going to be up here. Um, typically, um, cod fat uh, is going to be, again, like a cluster of grapes, and udder fat is going to be smooth fat. Uh, we can also have our um, we're going to have kidney, pelvic, and heart fat. Uh, that's going to be found internally. Uh, another good thing to take um, notes on for reasons. Um, so again, uh, if we are trying to evaluate whether carcass is a steer or heifer carcass, this will a lot of times be if you're getting asked questions. Um, make sure that you know if they're steer or heifer carcasses because that's a, a pretty easy um, and pretty good thing to ask you all. Um, of what those carcasses are. So not only can you tell by the fat on those, um, but you can also look here at their H bone. And so that's going to be the bone that is exposed up here at the, um, at the top, um, right here on this round. Um, and then you can also look at your um, semi-membranosis. So on heifer carcasses, that's going to be more of a bean shape. So see on this heifer carcass, it's kind of a bean shape. Um, whereas this, it's smaller um, on the steer carcass. Again, if we go back to our H-bone, um, we're going to be looking for um, our pizzle eye. So up here where it's denoted as D, um, that's the where they're uh, the, the animal, the steer's pizzle attaches, and so it's going to be um, usually a white piece of cartilage um, that you can see where they went in there and cut that uh, ligament off right there, and so that's an easy uh, way to denote if it's a steer versus a heifer carcass. So one of the big things on beef uh, that's different from um, pork and lamb judging is that we're going to have to determine a quality grade. And so uh, nearly 100% of the beef in the United States is quality and yield graded. Um, and the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, um, actually assigns those grades based on um, there's actually two, there's a formula for our yield grade. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and for quality grade, which will be what we'll first talk about, we're going to look at the marbling and then the maturity of that animal. And so we have four different USDA grades for young beef. That's going to be prime, which is our highest grade. Uh, we also have choice, uh, select, and standard, which is going to be our lowest grade.
And so quality grade, we're first going to look at the maturity. And so the first way that we're going to look at this is we're going to look at our buttons of our thoracic vertebra. So on a beef carcass, we go ahead and rib those carcasses, and we're going to look at these first three buttons from where that, down from where that carcass is, has been ribbed. Um, and so that's going to just be these little buttons of cartilage uh, that have not turned to bone yet. And we're looking to see how much of that has ossified or basically how much of that has turned to bone. On an amaturity carcass, they're going to have none of that ossified. Whereas if we get into a B or C maturity carcass, those animals are getting older and so more of this cartilage tissue is turning to bone. If we get into an old cow, let's say an eight or nine year old cow or a really old bull, this is all going to be bone. You're not going to have any of this bright white cartilage at the end. And so we want animals that are younger and so we're going to look and make sure that they don't have any ossification here and that they're a young carcass. We also look at their, the color of the lean in the ribeye, so the color of that muscle or the meat that you would eat in that ribeye. Um, we want a bright cherry red color. We don't want this like dark mahogany sort of brown color. Um, and so we want that that brighter cherry red color uh, within that color of the ribeye. So we're going to figure our skeletal maturity, which basically we balance our lean maturity with our skeletal maturity. And then we're going to go ahead and assess our marbling. Um, and so we have different marbling scores. So we can actually divide up our uh, prime and choice grades into high, average, and low, uh, select we only divide that up into high and low, and then standard, we also divide that into high, average, and low as well. So uh, if we look at this, we're basically looking at marbling. So this is the fat specs within that ribeye. So if we look at prime, which is our highest grade, there's going to be way more fat specs within that ribeye. If you go ahead and eat that, that's going to eat much, much better because as that fat cooks, it's going to turn into moisture and give you a much better eating experience than the select steak that doesn't have as much marbling. So generally, when you're placing classes, you're going to look at the level of marbling first um, and also look at your maturity of that as well. And so our biggest emphasis though is, all right, if I've got one that has a lot of marbling versus one that doesn't have a lot of marbling, this one almost always is going to be placed over this one with not very much marbling. Um, so hopefully this makes quite sense. Um, there's a lot of complexity to quality grading, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a crash course in quality grading. We also have yield grades. Uh, so this is basically, we're putting carcasses into groups based on their cutability or the amount of product that they're going to yield um, once they take off all the fat um, and also take out the bones from that carcass. How much actual product is there going to be there that you and I can eat? And so uh, we have a really long formula uh, for this that we're going to do some math and put into that, but essentially we're assessing our ribeye area, our, the weight of the carcass, the percentage of kidney, pelvic, and heart fat in relation to their hot carcass weight. Uh, and then we're also going to look at fat opposite the ribeye. Uh, for your all state contest, you do have to quality and yield grade um, some carcasses. And so uh, this is information that y'all need to know. Unfortunately for this, we don't have quite enough time uh, to do an in-depth uh, quality and yield grading discussion, but these are helpful to know uh, as we're evaluating uh, beef carcasses and beef cuts. So again, our, this is the factors that our yield grade equation takes into um, play. And so um, we have yield grade, uh, we'd have a yield grade one down here. Uh, that is a, a really, really heavy muscle, uh, really big ribeye, not a lot of fat. And so it's going to have a lower numerical yield grade. So a uh, yield grade of 1.0 is better than a yield grade of 5.0, which is what this carcass would be here on the right 
uh, that's not a very big ribeye. There's a lot, a lot of fat, uh, probably close to two inches of fat opposite this ribeye. Uh, if we go three quarters up our ribeye, um, that's going to be where we're going to measure that fat. Whereas here in the middle, we just have probably a yield grade three um, carcass that doesn't have a ton of fat, um, still very acceptable for that. So again, uh, we measure our fat thickness, uh, three quarters of the ribeye, where we split these carcasses at the 12th and 13th rib. Um, we can also grid um, and measure the amount of, or the area of our ribeye. So if we were referring to ribeye area, uh, we actually have grids that we can go ahead and grid ribeyes and we measure those in square inches. So as we go in of how do we place a beef carcass class? Well, our primary emphasis is going to be placed on quality. Um, any yield grade fours and fives um, or standards are going to go last always. Um, those have the least value when we go ahead and market those. Uh, they're also going to typically, if we look at our yield grade fours and fives, those are going to have a lot of waste that we can't market because they're usually really fat. Um, prime always beats all of the other grades. Prime, if we look at this from a value perspective, is always going to be the highest because it's associated with a higher level of eating quality and our consumers are willing to pay more for that higher level of eating quality. Um, high choice is always going to be low choice just because there's more premiums associated with our high choice. So that's going to be high and average choice grades. Um, low choice is always going to beat select and standard, um, and select, of course, is going to beat standard. Then, if we identify carcasses in which the quality grade is the same, then we're going to evaluate the composition. And so, again, we're going to place about 25% of our emphasis on trimness, um, and we're going to place about 15% of our emphasis on muscling between those. Uh, so trimness is always the bigger driver if we're looking at a pair that's close. Um, these same principles apply to um, our beef ribs, our short loins, um, or full loins that you might get. However, if we're evaluating rounds or our various beef cuts, so we'll look at a, a pair of T-bone steaks, um, we're going to not grade those. Um, and we're going to uh, place our emphasis on trimness and muscling um, and kind of fall back into our beef and lamb uh, placing rules on trimness and muscling. So sorry, I'm going a little fast, but I'm trying to get through all of this. Um, so if we look at this pair of beef ribs, which has more marbling? Again, that's these fat specks here within this ribeye. Two, yep, very good. Yep, and so two I would call uh, today uh, probably a low choice, uh, whereas one is going to pretty easily be a select, probably a low select. There's just not a whole lot of marbling in there. Now if we look at this pair of short loins, um, do we feel like marbling is fairly similar? Give you all a moment to type in. Yes, yep. Uh, so I feel the same. I feel that both of these are probably about a low choice. Um, and so then they're similar in uh, their quality grade. Uh, we're going to go ahead and then look at them on trimness. And so two is way trimmer than one as we look at fat opposite this ribeye, um, as well as probably also has a bigger uh, ribeye in this this short one as well. So then if we take it up a notch and we look at a full beef carcass class. Uh, what would be your all's placing of this class? Again, keep in mind marbling um, and trimness. All right, I'm seeing some good placings here. So um, definitely one has the greatest amount of marbling in this ribeye. This is actually an average prime carcass that this came off of. Um, whereas if we look at three, 
there's not very much marbling. And so, and also probably the, one of the two fatter carcasses as well. Um, and so marbling, definitely fourth. Um, and so that one's going to go last. Then we look at two and four. Two and four, probably fairly similar in their level of marbling. Um, two has less fat right here opposite the ribeye. Um, based on our computer image, probably has a, a, maybe a, a touch bigger uh, ribeye, not very, not a ton of difference in the ribeye size, uh, but definitely has less fat opposite uh, that ribeye up here. Four, um, maybe has a little bit less marbling, not a factor now. We think that they're both in the same quality grade. Uh, they're probably both average choices. Um, but we're looking here at this fat, two's definitely trimmer. And so the placing on this one is a one, two, four, three. Um, then if we move on, um, we have a pair of T-bone steaks. So again, we're not going to quality grade these. We're looking primarily at trimness. Um, and so one is going to be two. There's just much less fat over here along this um, loin edge. Uh, there's uh, less bone. So that's also going to factor in that. Basically, we want the most product that we can eat out of these steaks. So one is going to have way more product in here that we can eat. So hopefully this makes uh, sense to you all. I've had to cover quite a bit um, on this um, and hopefully I didn't go too fast, but if you all have any questions, please let me know. All right, well, I'm not seeing very many questions, um, but I hope you all in, oh, yeah. Uh, have a question, are sheep and goats similar? Um, yes, we don't typically evaluate um, goat carcasses just because we don't market a whole lot of goat uh, in the United States. Um, I honestly have, um, not evaluated goats um, in any of my meat judging experience, but um, they would be similar. Um, trimness is going to be the biggest driver. Uh, similar parts um, and anatomy to that of a sheep as well. Um, so yeah, good question. Uh, it'll definitely be interesting if we, we would see goats in a contest. All right, well, uh, it has reached 1130 here, so I'll uh, let you all go. I hope you enjoyed this um, and hope that you have some other really good sessions here in the coming days um, and that um, you all have a lot of fun. So thank you so much and we'll go ahead and get off of here.